You're listening to the Higher Calling Podcast. I'm Pete Newsom, and this is your source for all things hiring, staffing, and recruiting. I'm joined once again by Ricky Baez. Ricky, how are you on this Friday morning? I am doing great. Friday is here. Weekend is here. Weather's great for grilling. College football is the best time of the year, Pete. And Halloween season, which we both love. So that's right. This is good. Yeah. Yeah. Went to a couple of Hanukkah. Actually went to Halloween Horror Nights on Sunday. It was insane. It was insane, but well worth it. So we're we're gonna talk about something today that's hopefully a little less scary. But (laughs) only if you only (laughs) if you plan for it. And that that is succession planning. How to do it right. And and there's eight steps that we'll talk through. Now this is of particular interest to you right now because you're teaching a class at Rollins College about succession planning. That's correct. Right now, I've got about 21 students that are in their master's program, and we are talking about what succession planning is and how they can use it uh, at work or as a consultant, because this is something, I mean, I know you said it's not scary, but let me tell you, it's with the amount of organizations that don't use this, it is actually pretty scary for an HR consultant. So, uh, yeah, we need to take a deep dive well, into well, this. Well, why do you think, uh, I have a theory, but I want to hear from you, why, why do you think it, most companies ha- struggle with this? Because most companies have their favorite leaders, and they have their favorite leaders because of their interactions with them. And they don't take into account some of the skill sets that they're going to need to actually be successful. Right. Um, So a lot of organizations, a lot of these uh, senior executive leaders, they have their favorites and they're kind of afraid that their favorites may not be looked at the same from everybody else. Because uh, it's with succession planning, everybody has an input on a specific leader to be. Right. So I guess some some organizations say and I've actually heard this. We don't have time for succession planning. Now, that makes sense. Right. I mean, that makes sense to me. It's one of those things you don't have time for it until you need it and you realize you should have made time probably. Right. But that's that's like a lot of things in life and business. It, it, it is. It's just one of those things that the value isn't necessarily present without it being needed. Ah, it's when good way it's to put needed it. is when the value it's 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 felt. And then it's too late. Yeah, then it's too late. Right? Well, let, let's back up before we go forwards. And, and if you wouldn't mind, what is succession planning? You know, describe it briefly, if you could. Succession planning is, it, it, it's, it's, it's a strategy that you put in place that helps the organization put the right leaders in place in case somebody retires, somebody leaves unexpectedly, or they are forced out unexpectedly. Um, it, it's, it's the more time that goes by without a strategic leader in place, the more money you're, 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 you're losing and the less influence you have for you employees who do have that direct connect with your customers. That makes sense. And, and so you also answered the question there of why it's important for, for those very Absolutely. reasons. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause you want to know, I mean, it's always good to, to know that your favorite leader is always going to be there, but what if they hit the lotto? What if, unfortunately, they they pass away? What if they do something they're not supposed to and they get let go? The 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 business cannot stop. It still needs to propel forward, and you have to be ready for that. Absolutely. Well, we we know that change is inevitable. We know that things, you know, surprises come up constantly. So to prepare for those, it, it just makes sense on paper. I think uh, it's probably easier said than done. I think you have to apply foresight that most companies, you know, big. I think the bigger you are, the more resources you have for for that sort of effort. I think for small businesses, it's probably harder than for large. Would you agree with that? It's, it's actually easier for, mm. for, for small businesses. It's okay. easier because you don't have that many leaders to choose from <laughs> <Good right? point. laughs> versus large organizations. You have a huge pool and it, it, it does take more time. It does take more effort and it costs more money the bigger you are, but the more important it is. Understood. Well, all right, let's get into it. Let's, let's start with the first step and I think, uh, yeah, I'll let you, I'll let you lead this, but what, what is the first step? I know what we have a blog that we wrote, uh, on, on four corner resources about this that I asked you to challenge to see, you know, since you are knee deep into this right now to see if you agree. So, um, so I'll let you pick it apart to, uh, to, to, uh, to hear your thoughts. So, um, so step one. Excellent. Step one. So there are eight steps. So in this blog, there are eight steps for effective succession planning process. The first step is start early and make it an ongoing team effort. I could not agree with this more. This cannot be one of those once. Well, I mean, it is a once a year thing, but it cannot be one of those things that you only address 
when it's needed. It has to be a weekly thing. It has to be a monthly thing. It has to be a quarterly thing. The more you do it, the more consistent you are, the more comfortable your executive leadership is going to be in that process. And the key word here is process. We have to put this as part of the process. We have to do this as much as the one-on-ones. We have to do this as, as much as the quarterly reviews or annual reviews or biannual reviews. So the earlier you start, and the more often you do it, the easier it's going to get. So start early, make it an ongoing um, uh, um, uh, thing with, with your team. But the key is going to be consistency. You've got to be consistent with it, whether you're in research and development or finance. M- makes so much sense. Now, is this, you said it, it's the kind of thing you touch regularly, weekly. Does it, does it have to be that frequently? Can you, can you, is quarterly enough? Quarterly is enough. I mean, I say weekly because some organizations, they do have weekly meetings with their people, right? With their teams one-on-one. So if you're in a, in a, in a higher type of leadership position where you do have one-on-ones with a team leader, then every conversation has to have an ingredient in the conversation has to have a path, a leadership path forward. If the employee wants that. Right. right. If the employee wants that. So, yes, it, you got to have those conversations for it to be consistent and easy. And, and not every employee does. And that's OK. Right. We know that. That is perfectly OK. And actually, that that that's one of those things. You know what? Can I skip to the end real quick? Because that one right there is towards you're going to do that anyway. You do that no matter every time. So sure. Because number seven is use employee input to guide your de- decision. And I've said this in the past, Pete. It's you are you as the employer, you, you, you are the car, right? You are that employee's GPS and that employee has to drive their career and they have to tell you where they want to go in that career. And you should be able to help them along the way. I'm saying all of that just to say not every employee wants to be in leadership. Understood. Well, and we, we, we know that all too well. And again, if you're communicating openly on both sides, shouldn't be an issue. I think the, those problems arise when assumptions are made. And we all know, uh, you know what assuming does. So we, we shouldn't we shouldn't do it. Stay away from that. Just communicate, put it on the table, and understand what everyone's objectives are. Right? If you can do that, I mean, it sounds so easy. And and <laughs> sitting here now, it, it it makes sense. But we know those things are easier said than done. But if you start early and you plan, because that's what this is all about, right? Planning. And and, and yes. Okay, it, it, it's it is about planning, and folks, it, and I and I know a lot of organizations they they tend to shy away from it because, and look, I get it from a business leader's perspective, you don't want to spend a lot of time, money, and effort in things that doesn't necessarily bring immediate value. But the important to think here is the important thing to to really keep in mind here is is that this does provide value, but at a thirty thousand foot view, not right there. So you have to have the strategic mindset to understand the full value in this process. And that, and that's uh, why I mentioned earlier, by default, I would say the larger companies would have an easier time you know, having the resources to, to be more strategic, where I think a lot of small businesses just live in constant react, reactive mode. That's true, too. Not that they should, but it's more of, of, of necessity. Uh, however, having the discipline to plan ahead, to think medium term, long term, to really be strategic. It's one of those things, and, and as you know, business owner for 18 years now, I think about all the time. There's uh, the, those, those things that I know I need to do it, but boy, there's a lot of fires to put out on any given yeah. day, right? I mean, that's we have to be disciplined enough to make the time and and do the planning. And don't we train people to to do that, Pete? Don't we want a leader working for us that knows how to prioritize? Of right? course, I mean, it, it, it's this is something we train people to do. You have to prioritize. So. I mean, I guess it's one of those things that we we are receiving, we are experiencing a result from our our doing, right? We want something, somebody you can prioritize, and then somebody puts, I don't know, benefits packages on top of this, and this doesn't get touched, and then it becomes an issue. That's right. Well, what's what's the the, the saying, the cliche? If you fail to plan, then you should plan on failing, right? Plan so. on failing, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, let, but we are planning. We're doing this. So the next thing. You want to do is identify the type of leader you want, right? I mean, is uh-huh. that is that? Um, do you agree with that I thought do. in the process? I do, folks. You have to, in order for you to figure out what kind of leaders you want to cultivate, what kind of leaders you want to put in place, you have to know what your culture is. 
you have to know what your core values are and you have to create an environment where your leaders and your employees, even yourself, are living and breathing that culture. Now, not all cultures fit all leadership styles and not all leadership styles leadership styles fit all cultures. So from the beginning, you are going to want to decide what is the type of leader that you want? Do you want a pragmatic leader? You want a forward thinking leader? You want a leader who, who, who's really, really influential. It depends on a, the business you're in, the kind of customers you have and what kind of business dealings you have with that customer and what kind of culture you want the, the, the organization to show from a branding perspective. So these are some things that you really have to think about before you start putting together a succession plan. I think this is also an opportunity to make uh, improvements, to upgrade the, your leadership. As you know, it's all part of that picture. Every organization wants to be better tomorrow than they are today. No surprise there. But the leadership in place guides that probably as much, if not more, than anything else. You said something interesting right now because it it it, it it's because what happens is if you have an organization that always fills positions from within, right? Then, then yes, I mean, you are cultivating leadership, you are cultivating um, the type of influence you want and you would build a process for that. But remember, a succession management process completely takes away any type of opportunity from somebody from the outside to come in. Absolutely. Right? Because otherwise, why would you need it? Well, how are you going to grow, evolve and improve if everyone only knows the same way of doing things, the same style, the same approach? So that out, and, and I've had to come to appreciate that over the years where I, as an employee in, in my younger days, I thought, well, it, you should only promote from within. And I, because I've, you know, as an employee, that's what I'm striving for. I, I want to earn. Um, and then if I do, I think I deserve that to some degree. Now that's a bad word to use, right? We know better. I get it. But there is value in bringing in that outside expertise, new perspectives, way of doing things. And, and honestly, I wish I had earned that a lot sooner. I held on when I started my own business a, a long time ago. Now it was, I, I built it uh, to be the company that I wanted as an employee, but couldn't find. And one of those things was that internal promotions that I, I didn't want to bring people from the outside over the top of, of great employees um because i had that done to me and i didn't like it <laughs> but i see the value in it now uh, differently and uh, i wish i had uh, picked up on that sooner but uh, live and learn right that's why we're here now we know better and and we can share these these uh pieces of advice well pete i'll tell you this i don't know of anybody just starting out in their career who wouldn't feel that way because when i started out in 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 HR, I always thought, why would you want to go outside? You've got great talent in here. It wasn't until I grew up in my career and I was a leader that I'm like, oh, where, where we got blinders on. <laughs> we need fresh blood. We need fresh ideas. And so I don't know of any em new employee starting out in their career that would feel differently than what you and I did growing up in our career. So I completely get that, completely understand. So we mentioned earlier that change is inevitable. So yeah. The next thing on the list, plan for these vacancies, anticipate what's going to happen. And, and that's a great motivator to stop and, and consider succession planning, even when you don't think you have time to. Organizations that have a defined retirement plan, it's, it's easy for them because you have a formula that tells you what, how many people are going to leave you, quote unquote in X amount of years. The, uh, the uh, um, uh, Federal Aviation Association or the FAA, I think that's what it's called. The, uh, the, uh, the FAA has some rules about pilots that you cannot fly after a certain age. So mm. That tells a lot of these organizations, well, once you hit a certain age and you're still there, you're going to retire with us. I know how many pilots are going to leave in five years. So now I have five years to cultivate my leadership to get to that level. That way I don't miss a step. What is that age? Do we have any idea? I thought it was 62. I could be wrong. You can't flop at that, at that age, but you can add 22 and be president of the United States. <laughs> it's I mean, fine. Look, you, it's, I mean, if you're flying a plane, you got 200 souls on, like literally, right? At, at your fingertips. I mean, I think it's 62. Somebody please correct me. I don't know. I know call call, call me right. crazy, but have, having access to nuclear weapons uh, <laughs> seems like something you should have. Uh, Touché. You know, uh, but uh, I don't even want to talk about the average age in the, in our Congress. But um, yeah, the uh, 
so look, we, we, we should separate the type of vacancies, right? The, to your point, those are predictable. You know what someone's age is, you know what age they're going to be. And in a c- scenario like the one you described that they will be departing, people retire, there are predictable vacancies. So, but there's also those who d- that you don't see coming, right? So those are, those are two different considerations. So Pete, I, I'm about to say, I, I said this in class and the whole class cringe, but it's, it's just because the cringe is not false. You know, who's good at succession planning? Who? Drug cartels. Okay. Okay. No, seriously. They, they, they're great at it. When somebody goes to jail, oh, somebody always steps up. And when that person is in place, they're always training their right-hand person, right? There's this book. I, I suggest people pick it up. It's called Narconomics. And this book talks about how how you uh, how the drug cartels of today, if these folks who run those things would put those skill set they have for legal use, we would be in a much better place in this world. <laughs> but I'm saying that because you do have to plan for the vacancies that you see coming. You also have to plan for the vacancies you don't see coming, right? You always that seatbelt, right? That That's seat right. Belt, um, uh, uh, that that you're going to need, and how that works is. The plan you put in place for vacancies you don't anticipate, you always have to have two. It's like Star Wars. You always have to have a master and an apprentice. You were so good. You made it 15 minutes without a Star Wars reference. Ah. You Okay. You know I cannot go with a a show without talking about Star Wars, right? (laughs) No, but it's so here's the best way to gauge it. Whenever somebody goes, whenever a leader goes on vacation and you've already identified who that second in command is going to be, you put that person in this place. You don't call that person on vacation. You don't call that person in the hospital. You know, Susan got it. Billy got it. Marsha got it. Right. And you put them in those positions. And this is where you have to expect they're going to make mistakes. And this is where part of your strategy has to have a support system for those folks that are not 100% used to it. But if they make a mistake, HR and the senior leadership is there to help them through it. You've got to have a process for that just in case somebody gets hit by a bus or somebody hits the lotto and they just leave you, you've already got that one person that has 50% of the experience. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Once again, easier said than done. And that leads us to the next point, which is testing these scenarios in real life. Now that that's a, that's a challenge. You, you, you have to be willing to let your new leaders fall and scrape their knees. You have to be willing to let them fall, make a mistake, but you have to have a process to minimize the effect of that mistake for everybody else in the organization. Right? So anticipate if somebody is going to step up, even if they're not going on vacation, right? Just, Hey, why don't you take a step back and let Billy take over for, for a month and see how he does. Let's Susan, let's see how she does and have a mitigation plan in place in case, because remember, you got to take those calculated risks. You just can't take a willy nilly uh, a risk because you may cost the organization a lot of money, but the amount, the amount of money you spend, the amount of money you lose in those small mistakes is nothing in comparison to what would happen if you're not ready for that person to step up because then your clients are going to notice. So you have to, you know, compare those dollars and cents. Makes a lot of sense. So we're rolling along. You know, I, I, it occurred to me that you could make a whole uh, story you know, with your car analogy with this after you made the seatbelt comment. So that's my challenge to you is, is come up with a, you know, an entire you know, succession planning, you know, article about, uh, you know, w- with cars as the analogy. You know how so, annoying it is until yeah. you need it. <laughs> Something like that. Right. But, but there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, similarities there, I think. Um, so, so the next thing on the list, let, let's talk about hiring, right? We're higher calling here. We, we talk about hiring, staffing and recruiting, of course. So, you know, as, a, as we are talking, uh, you could be thinking, well, what the heck does this have to do with hiring, right? Well, a lot, because you don't just hire for today. You need to hire for the future and plan ahead. So no better, um, you know, no better tie to hiring than uh, succession planning. This is the rhetorical question to all the recruiters out there, right? The question is, how many times have a candidate asked you what, where, what, what's your, what's your um, career path team, right? What, what does your career progression look like? What's your plan for that? You have some employees that do make a decision on whether they jump ship from their current organization to yours on whether you have a good plan for them to move up. 
you got to think about why they're leaving their previous organization, whether it's money or no career progression. If you have a well-defined plan, sometimes that is the hook they're going to need to actually have them accept the offer letter and start with you. Absolutely. Right? Sometimes people do take a step back in their career for an opportunity to move forward in a new organization where the opportunity was absent in the previous organization. So if you have a well-defined plan, it better be a part of your of your of your recruitment marketing because that is a real hate to call it bait, but that's a really good incentive for people to done ship to come to you, especially if they're looking to progress in their careers. Well, I, as you know, I believe that a recruiter's job is not to convince candidates to take a job, that's true. right? That's true. To, you know, and I even made a post about this on, uh, on LinkedIn earlier this week saying that, look, a good, you, can, you can be a persuasive recruiter and convince someone to show up for an interview, even accept a job if you're persuasive enough. But that is not something you should be doing. You should present the, the full picture because the goal is for an employee not just to start the job, but to stay and, and have a happy ending at the end with all parties happy with the, with the, uh, the outcome in, in, in this case, we're talking about really long term, And so I think it's brilliant to present the full picture and not just here's the job today, here's the job, uh, uh, you know, and how it can evolve in, in on both sides. So recruiters should be having those discussions with their clients and saying, what, what is the path, right? Not, I know what it is today. That's great. That's, that's, we have to check those boxes. But what does the future look like? And candidates who think ahead, who think beyond the moment, they want to know those things. And if you don't have an answer, you're going to lose a, you're probably going to lose a lot of the best candidates out there. You got that right. And not only where, where, where the employee would go from a recruiting perspective, but also success stories. When I worked at Darden restaurants, Darden um, used to own Red Lobster. And I'm gonna I'm gonna name drop here. Dave Pickens. He used to be the president of of a Red Lobster about ten years ago. He he has since been retired. You know how he started in that organization as a bus boy in the late '60s, early '70s. He wow. started as a bus boy, made it all the way up to president of the organization. If that doesn't tell a candidate that this organization has a well thought out succession management plan, then I don't know what will. And Darden did. Darden did do that. They had a year long manager and training program to 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 have the next leaders ready just in case somebody decides to leave. So it's a great marketing tool. And you know what? And if you have that out there, honestly, Pete, recruited, you're right. They don't have to convince anybody. Correct. <laughs> right? Correct. And the it's there and everything says it. And the only question you have to say, when do you want to start? That's right. And then go from there. What a great story though. I mean, oh, what? From bus boy to president of the entire organization. I didn't know that. Okay. Right? I love it. That's great. Uh, doesn't happen often enough, but uh, that, that's, that's, um, there's no b better testimony, uh, to, to, like you said, an organization thinking ahead. So, um, now input, you mentioned that that's next on our list, communication internally, talk to your employees. Not everyone wants to be a leader. That's not a surprise. Um, but it doesn't mean they're less valuable to the organization. That's correct. And, and the biggest mistake a leader can make about their employees is to put them in a leadership position when the employee A is not ready or B, more importantly, they don't want to. <laughs> right? So what happens is, is these conversations need to happen often in the one-on-ones, right? Every one-on-one -on -one about the employee's performance has to have at least five minutes in there about where do you want to go, where do you want to be, and how can I help you get there? Now, notice I said, I'm not going to get you there, how I, as a leader, can help you get there. I'll give you the blueprint. I'll give you the map. You have to walk. You got to do that. And, and, and it's up to the employee. And if the employee says, no, boss, I'm good. I'm just going to stay here and be an analyst, then help them be the best analyst the organization has ever seen. Absolutely. And then do that, and then you're all set. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Well, Ricky, the last thing on our list is to enlist the help of experts uh, where necessary. So. We have you, we have great recruiting organizations like Four Corner Resources who will look beyond just the, the basic job description. So there's multiple avenues to go in that direction. And um, you, know, you really do. I mean, I can't state this enough. And of course I'm biased, but I've been doing this for a long time successfully. And, and this is what I've learned that 
you need to look at the bigger picture when you're recruiting. Don't just look at the skills on a job description. Look at who the individual is, right? And that, that's how I used to, to take job orders, job recs from, from prospects and clients. I'd say, great that you, you're telling me the, uh, the, the details of the job, the hard skills. Tell me who you need to hire, right? I want to want to understand what you expect of this person over time, not just can they do the job, do they, will they, will you want them in the job, right? Where's the future of the job? And, and the same conversations need to take place with candidates. It's not about can you do it? Is this a job you want to be in and for the right reasons? So that's expertise from a recruiting standpoint. We need to draw these things out in the conversations we have, but what about from your perspective as a as an HR consultant, where can you add value in these discussions? Look, Pete, I, I, it's, um, I know that YouTube is really big right now. I know a lot of people, when they want to do it yourself, they go on YouTube, right? I learned a long time ago, don't go that route. I just had office installing my lights and you think I'm going to do it? No, because you'll see me in the news about some guy who burned his whole neighborhood down because he didn't know what he was doing, right? What I'm saying is there's experts out there, right? If you want somebody to come in, if, if you're saying you don't have time for this, Okay, I understand that. Bring somebody in who does this for a living and they will take this off your hands. And all you have to do is just say, what kind of leaders do you want? And an expert will come in and make this happen for you. That will save you a lot of headaches because although you should leave, put leeway for your employees to make mistakes and have them learn from it, it's not necessarily the same from the executive leadership putting something like this because. If they make a mistake with this, it will cost them talent. Talent will jump ship, especially the talent that has high caliber and that other people are courting them. We cannot afford to make a mistake here. So bring somebody in from the outside who can help you, especially exactly how you said, Pete. What separates your organization, right? It, it, it's four corner resource from everybody else. It's exactly what you said. You don't just look for somebody to bring them on board and then cash a paycheck, you want to make sure that your client has somebody that's going to be with them for the longest time, right? Not looking five minutes in front of you, but five months, five years in front of you. And that is the kind of, uh, of, of, of a thought process that separates the professionals from the amateurs who learned it on, on YouTube. Great. Um, I love it. And look, Ricky, we, um, we have, a number of examples in this blog article that uh, I encourage everyone to read. Um, we won't go into them now, but it's it's got some tools that, that we recommend. It has some um, examples of, of great organizations who, who've done very well with this, and it has some mistakes to avoid. Now, I do want to touch on the mistakes just briefly I'm and run right through now. those, because so far, I think you're given you a pretty good grade on this blog that, uh, yeah. that, 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 um, you know, that we have. So not spending time and energy on, uh, um, on succession planning. Well, we already have identified that that's a mistake, mm -hmm. right? You have to do it. Um, not including the full leadership team. So what, what's your take on that? Excluding some individuals, uh, something to avoid. Huge mistake. Huge mistake. Because here's why. They're a leader in your organization. Somebody above them saw something in these folks that said they're going to be a great leader. If you're going to trust them with that kind of responsibility, why would you not trust them to give input on the future of the organization, <laughs> right? Correct. They have an input. The more eyes from a leadership perspective you have on this, the better position you're going to be on getting it right because you're attacking one issue from 20 different points of view. The more leaders are involved, the better. Perfect. And one of the things that, that's on this is, is uh, to avoid is having a small pool of prospective oh. leaders. And, and one of the themes, you know, when, when we do these podcasts, you never really know where we're, we're going to end up, right? We, we have a starting point, but the finish line sometimes looks entirely different. And the, one of the themes that I think through our conversation today has been there's value in looking internally and there's value and necessity to look externally. So you have to do both if you're really going to do it right. And that's a point we wanted to make in this blog article. Hopefully it came across, um, but that's uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, just coincidentally, that's been a recurring theme through our conversation. So it's, it's, I've, I've been waiting for you to hit on that one because having a small pool of, of potential candidates, that is, that is the equivalent of shooting yourself in the foot, right? Because you have to make a decision, right? 
if you have a small pool of potential candidates, then what are you doing to get them ready? How are you hiring? Right? Because this this goes back to to the hiring piece, right? If you see somebody, if you're if you're interviewing somebody that is perfect for the current role, but they're years away from being a leader, you have to make a decision about what if you hire that person, how much is it going to cost in time and money? Because time is money to get that person trained up. So you have to know what that is, what that threshold is, and maybe put a succession plan in place where there is an, an MIT, a manager in training program that gives people the fundamentals of leadership to bring them to the very bottom, at the least the minimum fundamentals that they need to be in the succession planning process. So that is crucial right there to make sure that you make a decision how you want to train and how much money you want to spend to bring them up to speed later on. I love it. There's more in the blog. There's tools listed. There's other resources, Ricky. We'll put your contact information uh, in the show notes and, of course, the link to the article. But I think that's a great place to stop because we've yeah. we've really put a, a bow around it. I didn't say our other phrase today. I avoided it. Ah, yeah, don't do it, yeah. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll skip it for one week. But this has been great. Thank you so much. If you've listened this far, thanks for joining us as always. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you uh, very soon. Be back next week. Ricky, thank you. Thank you very much, Pete. Have a good one, folks. See you in a few.